I met a gypsy. The uh, the newest recruit of the Star Racing Monster Energy Factory Yamaha team, Danger Boy Hayden Deegan. How's that sound, mate? Yeah, it sounds sweet. It's a uh, it's a new adventure. Yeah, man, it's been uh, it's been pretty cool to watch like the the rollout that you guys have done. Um, I think the uh, I mean it's just played out cool the way that. Um, you know, you got your KTM, like your 250 at Loretta's from KTM. And then it was like, I feel like everyone was pretty convinced that you were going to star. And then you got the KTM 250 and then you started testing the factory bike. So I feel like it's been pretty fun for everybody to watch this whole process play out. But I'm sure it's probably a bit of a relief now that it's like out and you can just like get to work in a way. Yeah, I know. We were like, we were like trying our best to make it like the biggest surprise because everyone obviously had their thoughts and everything so it was kind of going back and forth so we could uh, get everyone amped up when uh, the release happened and uh and every well it's actually crazy to me that it stayed so quiet because i mean i genuinely didn't know like your dad told me uh a couple days before he's like hey we got a big announcement coming on monday and i was like oh shit okay i didn't even really know that that was going down at all um, so it actually surprised me how quiet it kind of did stay. Did you get the feeling that a bunch of people kind of knew or, uh, or like, were you worried that it would come out earlier than you guys getting to do the announcement? Well, there was like a few other like little channels that were like releasing their information saying, trying to say where I was going to go before I even had a contract signed. So I thought that was kind of funny anyways. But anyways, yeah, like I didn't sign the contract until like maybe like it was only like honestly probably two weeks ago if that because i was at my sister's nascar race and i did it so uh it was not a long time ago there was a lot of people like oh he did it like at loretta's or something i'm like no no so yeah it's been a it's been a little bit of a wait the uh the funny thing i was actually gonna um text your dad this the other day we we posted that clip i was talking about with like the little segment that we had to cut out um of the podcast and then dude just like a thousand YouTube comments of people that know more about your deal than you do. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah, I know. I know. It'd be like, I'll be like, dang, how, that guy actually knows more than I know. That's awesome. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. funny. Yeah, it's like maybe we need to hire a couple of these dudes as like PR guys. I know. It'd probably be honestly a good idea. <laughs> uh, it's good though, man. Like, because I, I mean, I, I don't know how much you think about this kind of stuff, but. It's pretty rad what you guys have going on in terms of uh, like it's entertainment for people as much as it's like serious racer deal. Like you're as serious and dedicated to racing as it gets, but you guys are also providing a lot of entertainment for people. Like you're giving people a chance to follow along this crazy journey. And I honestly think it's cool that like you don't seem to play into the camera thing too much like you can tell you're not sort of playing a character it's probably just because it's been around you so long you're just like whatever i'm over it like i just be myself and then do my stuff and then the boys make the videos um but it is pretty cool the way that you guys are bringing everybody along and it's like it's serious racing but then there's also this like entertainment and i think that sometimes with racing it gets taken so seriously that the like the average punter that just watches the races almost forgets that he is watching it just because he enjoys to yeah definitely it's like i have a few goals you know goal to obviously just have a goal and uh, gotta focus on that so like it's cool to have the cameras around and stuff but again they're i it's like they just kind of you know film stay behind uh, the window a little bit and get everything that's going on but I got to keep focusing on what I'm uh, trying to achieve. Yeah. And, and I think that that comes across too, like, because I mean, it'd be easy to uh, like really play into it and stuff, but I guess you guys are making so much content that it's just like a, this daily routine. Like you'd kind of get over it in a sense, not over it in a bad way, but over it in terms of like, you're not trying to be anybody else. Yeah, honestly, like that's how it is. Like I'll be like, I basically almost film probably every day of every time I'm riding, I always have the camera around. So it's definitely like at this moment now, it's like you almost sometimes don't even notice that the camera's around anymore because it's kind of natural and you're just trying to focus on what you're doing through your day. How, um, 
how much does it help your riding to just have a camera around all the time? Because I feel like any time I get to watch myself ride, that's when I actually improve because I can see what I'm doing wrong. And the fact that you are being filmed every single time you ride is pretty sick. Yeah, I know. It's like at the Supercross and Motocross races, you obviously have a guy for each team that films your riders so you guys after can go study like what, okay, we need to change this, change that. And it's like, I have that like every day, able to film, like my filmers filming me um, on the Supercross track. Oh, I need to fix this. Like I'll watch the videos after I'm done riding or the next day when they come out. And I'm like, okay, I see where I need to get my feet in here or change my posture through the whoops. It's like, it's constantly being able to study yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that is cool, man. It's a pretty, pretty gnarly benefit. Um, so we'll talk, just, we'll talk about the star deal. So you, I mean, your dad was pretty open about like wanting to stay at KTM. I'm sure you feel like nostalgia for KTM because it's like eight years that you were there and then they're obviously trying to keep you like for you to make that decision to go to star, like what was going on in your head for like the last few months to try and make this decision? Yeah, it was crazy. Again, like at Loretta's, you know, obviously I wanted to perform the best so I can obviously impress the teams and get the best I can uh, get of deals. So that was my focus at Loretta's is obviously do as good as I can. And then it kind of came down to the time where I had to decide. And I obviously went to meetings with the teams and they all tell, you know, kind of what you want to hear. So it's like, oh, do I want to go here? Do I want to go here? And like, I definitely wanted to stay with KTM because they're obviously a great team and they obviously had my back a lot because I've been with them for eight years, but it was just overall deciding what's going to be best for the future, not where I'm at at the moment. And uh, Star was that decision. So we went over to Star and they honestly have the best training program. I hopped in like first week I signed the deal. I was ready in Florida training, um, road biking over 170 miles in three days. So it was like, you're, you're getting in shape and you're getting ready to uh, getting ready for these nationals coming up. So it was, uh, you hop right into it and uh, there's no waiting around. Yeah, man, it, it's pretty sick. And I, I love the way that you just attack training, dude, you know, because that's like the part of this whole process that's like the necessary evil, you know, like, and, and I'm sure that if everyone come together and everyone made, uh, like you get all the boys on every start line and be like, all right, we're not going to train. We're just going to ride. Everyone would be like, sweet, yeah. perfect. <laughs> Let's all do that. But you yeah. seem like you seem like a kind of guy that you you want to embrace the grind. You're like, "Let's go. Let's just get this done." Oh, 100%. Like I used to train with Caleb Tennant, so I was uh fortunately one of the faster kids in the group, so there wasn't really much people that I could really chase after cuz we had a lot of 85 and super mini kids in the group and they were kind of chasing after me, so it was like really like hard to find like some more I guess speed to catch somebody. So I could just find who was at Paula that day, try to chase him down or whatever. But right when you hop into Florida down here with all the star guys, you basically I mean there's a lot of guys on the team. You got eight good dudes, eight probably roughly good dudes on the team you're lining up with, and I'm like right now not the fastest guy on the team, obviously. So. I was probably, me and Romano, and uh, we've been training together, so he's uh, the other amateur kid, and right now I'm just chasing after him, uh, so that's obviously going to make me a lot faster, chasing, as, uh, chasing after somebody faster than me, uh, it's going to work me, so <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah, and I think that's like kind of the other thing, because, so for you, right, like you're the son of Brian Deegan, your sister's a famous NASCAR chick, it's like... You've got a million subscribers on YouTube. You kind of like everyone's criticism of you would be like, ah, oh, here's this little rich kid that's just got everything handed to him. Like that's the narrative that people could say about you, right? And then what do you do? You go, hey, I want to sign to the gnarliest team and I want to be the slowest rider on their team and I just want to try and get better. That's like the opposite of what a spoiled rich kid would do. So I think that you know yeah. in that in that lane it's like i think you signing this deal in particular um it sort of speaks a lot about like your character and like what you want to achieve and like how you see yourself because yeah like it's it's way more fun to be the man right than be the dude that everybody's waxing every day yeah definitely and obviously i'm really grateful for the position i'm in so 
it's just like you get thrown into like uh, a training group like this it's like you got to stay humble and uh, especially when guys are fast and you got to stay really yeah. humble because uh, you can't be like oh I'm faster than you when really you're not so yeah I just like to stay humble and uh, keep fighting keep fighting until I get up to their pace and that's the the way it's going I never want to be Trey you know like the cool kid or whatever it is you know I want to obviously stay back and you know just keep on grinding yeah yeah no I think it's a move man and and yeah to be like super young and to have that headspace because you know like we were talking we did the podcast with Jalik Swole the other day and you know he first year rookie season was like as bad as a rookie season could be and then what he went back to was just like it's all mental it's all mental it's all mental like just get the mental game figured out and it's like to have the attitude that you got at that age like that's the move man yeah definitely and like obviously there's a few kids in the amateur ranks that like act pretty cool and i see like what people think of them I'm like oh, i don't want to be that kid and i just try to you know stay stay humble too because you never know you go into the pro ranks like 250 you don't know where you're gonna stand exactly so you got to stay humble coming to that obviously as well because your rookie season you never know you could think you're gonna be going out there and hopefully winning but you could again be getting shuffled back because it's just such gnarly racing yeah man definitely so you got the um 250f ktm and then you did some testing for the factory team what was the, like, forget about the deals and all that sort of stuff. What was it like the first time you rode a factory big bike? Yeah, I know. KTM brought, like, a, a factory bike because it was right before contract time. So they wanted to, you know, obviously test the good bike, see what I'm going to be riding. And, you know, you show up with the two KTM vans. It's all professional and stuff. Usually I just go to the truck my van and dirt bike. And uh, it was like, oh, geez, like, it's like, it's pretty cool definitely getting around to be around those guys, Dungy's testing the KTM. It's like you're right next to like the big times, big time guys. So bike was like, you hop on a pro bike, it's uh, a factory bike. It's a lot faster, a lot faster than your uh, average mod bike. So you're like getting used to it and stuff. And uh, it's just crazy. Everyone, you know, kind of all the team guys are watching. It's definitely a lot of pressure, but yeah, from there, it's just, you know, just trying to find your comfort zone on the bike and see what's best for you. And what was the, like, what was your impressions of that factory KTM? Like, motor-wise, suspension-wise, was it quite a big difference to what you were used to? Yeah, definitely. On my, I had my stock 250F at the moment, and uh, Jamie did some mapping on it to give me a little more power. So I was riding a stock bike, and then when I test the factory bike, suspension was a lot stiffer. I had like uh, the basic WP stuff built on it, so it wasn't like super stiff. And uh, got on the KTM, super stiff, so we had to obviously soften the suspension up a little bit. But like motor-wise, it's like a whole different world when you get on a factory bike from a stock 250. It's like the power is crazy on those things. And uh, especially KTM has a lot of mid to top power, so it like pulls gnarly, but overall it's pretty cool. And then you go to the star bike, another factory bike, factory motor, and you get on that thing, and that thing's got the gnarliest torque I've ever ridden on a dirt bike. It's so sick. And uh, obviously, it has some gnarly mitted top. It pulls hard. But right when I got on that star bike, I was like, dang, this is going to make the decision a lot harder because this thing goes <laughs> gnarly fast. <laughs> yeah, it so, was like crazy. I was like... Oh, sorry, keep yeah. going. No, you're good. Yeah, yeah, dude. So um, when, we did, <laughs> when I did the podcast with your dad... I was just like, have you ever ridden one of those those YZ250s, man? Because, like, they're pretty ridiculous. I went and rode at Townley's in, like, 2019. I'd never ridden one of those bikes before. I was like, what is this thing? Like, is this for real? And, uh, yeah, it just turns out it was just a stock um, Yamaha 250. And uh, I was like, uh, okay, this makes a lot of sense why the star bikes are so good. Because you get, like, this base package this base motor that's insane so obviously when you start modding that thing um it's going to turn into a monster and then that's pretty much how it yeah. worked out for you you were just like what the hell yeah i know i was like dang this thing's crazy because obviously i went back to florida and tested their uh race bike like they use for the 250 class and pros to get a good feel on it 
and it was just like you just every corner wheeling out of everything i was like dude this thing's so sick but uh, obviously a lot of the good bikes are really close too in uh pro racing because they they got to make it obviously as close as they can so they're up front but the star bike definitely was crazy yeah and then the the first time you rode it um that the track was deep too man like super super deep yeah definitely um on the ktm the track wasn't as deep because i rode paula and glen helen so it was more fast speed and when i rode the star bike in florida they had the track tilled so it was just uh definitely rings your ears like i rode the the factory bike and it's so loud it like I had to wear earplugs because you're just pulling, you're going wide open through that soft stuff and it's ringing your ears because it's such a gnarly power and just so loud, but uh, it just like pulls through everything. It's so nice. Yeah. And then I can imagine going into Supercross, just having that, that power everywhere that you want it. Um, it's got to make yeah. you kind of more confident. Yeah, definitely. Um, star bike on Supercross is outrageous. I rode Supercross for the past two days. It's got the gnarliest torque. Like you mess up with section, you get you just get a little clutch right in the transition. You're back tripling. It's like, it's it's a it's a nice Supercross bike. So I saw uh, on the video at one point like Ferrandis is out on the track, and I'm sure there are a bunch of other guys run. It actually looked like you did a lot of laps that uh that first day that you rode supercross um how do you reckon obviously you're not trying to be speed wise like you're not going all the way as fast as you can and that's not the plan and it's not the move for you to just go out yeah. and try and go uh that fast first day but was there because i mean there's got to be a point where you're like you wake up in the morning and you know you're about to ride supercross for the first time on your factory bike you got to be a little bit like shit man like can i can i do this uh so what was it like your expectations wise and then did you see the speed they were going and think like oh i can eventually do that yeah i watched like colt nichols dylan and uh i sat there before i went on road um just watched them go through the whoops they got some crazy whip speed and then just seeing colt's like burn how he hit the turns how hard he hit them and like uh, like seeing how he races supercross and it's like oh that kind of makes sense he's hitting the turns that hard probably gives me a good reason why he's obviously up front so uh, i was kind of just going to give that to myself to go out in the supercross track and kind of copy what colt was doing um not to the pace he was going obviously because not up there yet but um just got out in the track and uh just try to be smooth the first day on the bike so just getting the track figured out and uh, we practiced the whoops a lot because I was trying to get those dialed on the 250. First time I ever rode the Supercross track on a 250 and uh, got thrown on the gnarly fast bike. So it was uh, a fun time getting to hit all the fat rhythms and uh, those bikes handle crazily good. Like you'll clip a rhythm, barely feel it. Like the suspension's just crazy. Going through the whoops handles like super nice and uh, you got the suspension guy there too with you watching you do the whole track. So. He obviously watches me through the whoops. Oh, we'll make this change. We'll do this. It's sweet. It honestly just sounds like fun. Like that sounds just like a fun yeah. day of riding. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, everyone's just watching you and you're getting ride with the factory guys. It's like, how would you ever want to give this up? Yeah, well, you're one of those factory guys now. It's like, you, you know, you, you're saying like, oh, you get to ride with the factory guys. Like, hey, you're the factory guy now too. Yeah, I know. It's crazy getting to ride with these guys and uh, be one of the guys. So it's uh, definitely a good path. So uh, Swanee, uh, I, did you know Swanee that much before you signed the deal and like come out here? Or I knew Swanee a little bit. I seen him at the tracks and Caleb and Swanee are, are I believe, yep. from South Africa both. So they Caleb talked about him a little bit. And looking at the different teams, I knew who his trainer was. And he came and talked to me a few times here and there just to see how it's going. So I kind of knew who he was, but nothing crazy until I really came out here to Florida and started training with him. Yeah, he is a really, really cool dude. And he knows his shit, man. Like we were talking before we started recording that, that, that advice. I, I loved that clip. And the way that he sort of said to you, he was just like, hey, man, if you get this figured out now, it's going to really help your career. That's just like, that's some really legitimate 
OG advice from that guy. And you could see, like, I kind of got the vibe of what he was saying about basically, like, you want to get into this body position before the whoops and then just, like, lock yourself in, stay in that position and just go through them. And then to it was cool to, like, see you instantly take that on board and just, like, do run after run after run through the whoops. Yeah, it's good when someone can see something in you that is not perfected yet. Like Swanee found a few things in me that needed to be fixed, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more things that uh, down the road will have to be fixed. But uh, one of those was getting into the whoops, and that stuff right there will lead to a better career later down the road in Supercross because it will uh, lead to better technique, and you know that um, leads to better pace through the whoops. So definitely needed that, and uh, it's going to help me a lot. Yeah, man. And so what's like the, the, oh, had you been to the goat farm before you went, uh, like your first day with star? No, I never been to the goat farm. I only seen it on like some of Ricky's videos. Cause that's where he grew up. So yeah. And it was funny. Uh, probably yeah. Yesterday when we were training, Ricky's mom came and trained us cause Swanee, uh, had something going on. So she comes in, uh, trains us as well and she's she's definitely into it it's super cool seeing ricky's mom still being a part of the program ricky came out and watched they're all still a part of the facility you know and she uh she like we were doing a section in it we had to get a, our fastest lap time we did it like 10 times we got our fastest lap time and uh, we had to get that same lap time or under it two times in a row and she yeah. kept us going and going and going until we got that lap time and uh, eventually we got down to it, but it was just crazy how she uh, she's bringing it to us on how she raised Ricky. So it's definitely uh, something crazy. Yeah, man, I I, uh, I got like Townley's told me stories when he went there to live with Ricky and they would basically just do these like sections or like what you said, where you got to do your fastest lap time out of 10 laps and then you got to get it twice in a row. And yeah, Townley's just got these like, horror stories of her just like grinding him until he got it and it sometimes took like hours and he's like i was so mad while i was riding like just so angry because i couldn't do it the track's getting rougher and then you've got to get a faster lap time he's like it just mentally cooks you but then you get it and then you're like oh wow this was like this was the move yeah, definitely. Stuff like that, too, makes you overall just a better rider and a stronger rider um, doing those things, too. Like, keep fighting through it, and it would relate to, like, supercross races, you know? You can't get that lap time or anything. Just keep fighting, or you got to get these positions, keep fighting, and that's what I think she, like, tries to relate to a lot. Yeah, 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 because it, it is hard to simulate that stuff, especially when you're just doing it every single day. Like, you're you're about to enter this grind now in your life and i mean you've been grinding the whole time it's it's not like you've been taking it easy but i i think now you know you're about to enter this next kind of like 10 year period where your life is just going to be given to this dream that you've got and if you can if you can keep that focus for the next 10 years and if you can stay healthy and just tick all the right boxes then you're going to get to where you want to be um and it's all of those kinds of things because it sort of just becomes like a mental game you know like how can you simulate racing when you're just going to the same track every day for 10 years how can you keep that um you know like that fight so to have someone like her around and then you know this just the whole team in general that they've like they've produced these results before um it sort of makes it easier for you just to like do your job you know yeah, definitely. There's a lot of motivating people there, too, at the track because you got Justin Cooper, Colt Nichols, Dylan. Those guys are all champions, so they know what, what needs to go down to be a champion. So being around them is a, a big help. And uh, I got my, like, all my yearly goals written out, and uh, I just try to pursue those. And if I uh, keep my head where it needs to be and stay grinding, I think I can uh, pursue those when I'm older. Yeah, for sure. What When you say you write down your goals, like where do you write that stuff down? Uh, like on my computer, I write like my yearly goals down. Uh, like uh, just type them and then print them and just like I have them in my backpack. So just check them over every here and there. So you see if I'm still in line. That's sick. What, what sort of like to what level do you write goals down? Is it only just like race results or do you have like personal goals as well or? 
yeah, some of my goals are like being a better person on and off the track, you know, just myself acting good and staying humble and just being a respectful kid. That's one of the goals. And, you know, the other goal on track wise is just to never give up, keep fighting and uh, have a goal for the nationals too, like what I want to go do and win. So, and just how I'm going to do that. So those are kind of my goals that I want to achieve. Yeah, man, they, uh, I think one of the like powerful things that maybe not a lot of people f do in life or figure out is that like, there's like this accountability, right? So you put yourself out there. So you're like, all right, I'm Hayden Deegan. I've just signed this contract and I want to go dominate at Minios. It's like, that's like a gnarly thing to say. And most people would be scared of saying that because if you don't do it, then, you know, you can get in your head and be like, fuck, if I don't like, if I don't win, if I don't dominate, I said I was going to do it. So it's like, it's hard to put that much pressure on yourself, but it's like, that's what champions do, right? They like go out on a limb and they attach their name to something. And then it's like a pretty bold goal. And then they just like stay committed to doing it. Is it, does it just feel natural to you to like make those big claims and then just work your ass off to back them up? Like how much of that is, you know, a part of your process? Yeah, it's like, I may not go win minios. Like it could go both ways, but my goal is to grind all the way and work to what I want to like work for what I want to do at minios and put my best effort into it. So I can go and attempt to do that. I could say, but my goal is to mentally say I want to go win so I can mm. mentally just keep fighting for it. It's hard though, like for, I mean, maybe it's not hard for you, but I think a lot of people do find it hard to really put a goal in their head and then put it in other people's head too um, because it's scary when you say something and, you know, like you have to face the back, like you said, it could go either way. Um, sometimes the easier road is just not to say anything. But are you really going to work as hard if you haven't put yourself out there and you haven't said what you want to do? Yeah, that's kind of how I am. I feed off the pressure. I like a, And, you know, there's those people on Instagram that doubt you here and there. They just give you the pressure. And I just kind of feed off of that. And that's what kind of keeps me, keeps me grinding. Yeah, well, you look at a guy like, uh, like Cooper Webb, you know. He's that dude. He just makes those yeah. big calls, rides red plate on his pit board, talks shit on the start line. It's like, yeah, man, if you if, if you want to, like, uh, I guess you've, you've got to kind of speak those things into existence sometimes, right? Yeah, definitely. You just got to put your mind to it, kind of. So, uh, so you pretty stoked to be done with two strokes now? <laughs> yeah, I mean... It's definitely a big step from a two-stroke to a four-stroke because it's a whole different power ratio. It's like going from a two-stroke, you gotta you gotta really flow the bike because two strokes don't like just have that instant or like power like the four-stroke. So it was. Uh, I may not be completely done with the two-stroke. Who knows? I might make a sick two-stroke video or something. But at the moment, I'm kind of done with the two-stroke. Been on it for about eight to nine years now, so it's time to just uh, figure this four-stroke out. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, uh, it is cool though. Like, I'm sure there'll be a point where you look back at the footage of say like Loretta's when you're like this massive dude on this super mini and you're just smashing that thing around the track. Like, because yeah. I mean, when you when you get on a 450, it's like you just can't ride like that. So I'm sure there's probably going to be a point when you're looking back at your like last year at Loretta's being like, damn, I miss being able to ride a dirt bike like that where you could just like smash the entire track. Yeah, where you just throw it around. Like the Super Mini, I got pretty big on it. So you just throw it around kind of like through the bumps. You could like hop through them and stuff, which now on the big bike, I'm going to be like not as big as I was on the Super Mini. So I'm going to have to kind of use the power to hop bumps more and definitely use the suspension to my advantage and not being not, I'm not going to be so dominant on the bike anymore. It's going to be me just having to be smart with the bike. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, man, won't keep you too much longer, but I uh, appreciate you coming on. It's always, uh, it's always cool to talk to you, man. I, I'm definitely a, definitely a fan from, from over here, and I think it's rad just the... I just think the effort that you put in is what's cool. 
you know, like you really care, you really try hard. And I think that, you know, like we said, people can talk shit and they'd be like, ah, kids got everything. This, Hey, you can't teach the desire that you have and you can't, you can't teach like, like you said, you love pressure. So I think, uh, keep that up, man. Like as much as I feel like it's just in you in general, like that's just who you are. But um, it's cool, man. And I think that that's the thing over time you can be known for, you know, like right now you just, you still do you know, Brian Deegan's kid and like people can still say that, but there's going to be a point if you keep going with like this mental attitude, like you would, you are a savage, like mentally you are a little mm. savage. And over time, I think that that's going to be like the dominating narrative. Like that's going to be the story that people say. They're going to be like, this Deegan kid is a little animal. Like, uh, so yeah. it's, it's cool to, uh, it's cool to see that. And like, that's, that's what I'm a fan of, man. Like in your writing is just like, you can just see you're a little savage. And I think that's the shit that's going to win championships and races down the line. So don't, don't, uh, don't stop that and uh, keep doing your thing, man. It, and it's really cool to, uh, to watch this, uh, this journey that you're on, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Just going to, keep grinding my way up there and uh, maybe one day we'll uh, be winning some Supergrass titles and outdoor titles. So we're just gonna keep doing our thing. And man, not to mention, I feel like, I, I, I know for a fact, like just because I see our YouTube comments so much, I've got a lot of comments. Like when we posted the video of, uh, we posted your dad's podcast and your podcast for the first time. And then even that clip we posted the other day, so many people comment and say, I got a dirt bike because of the Diggins YouTube channel. So, I mean, regardless of even like winning and all that sort of stuff, like just the amount of people that you guys have got stoked on dirt bikes and you know how much fun you have riding a dirt bike with your dad and, and you know, your brother. And it's just like, you've given that to so many people as well. So even dude racing aside, like that's just a good thing to be involved with. Yeah, I love uh, I love just to influence kids, you know, to go ride, no matter what bike you have, honestly, just to go out there, ride, have fun, and uh, especially little kids, you know, a lot of them just want to sit on video games. It's, it's cool to influence them to go outside and ride dirt bikes and stuff. It's uh, a lot different than anything that a lot of people do. Yeah, definitely, dude. Well, um, yeah, good luck for Minios, man. I'll obviously be watching, and uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully you can go get get it done there but um either way man it's gonna be super cool sweet thank you if you enjoyed this content please like and subscribe and to listen to the full three-hour podcast search gypsy tales in your favorite podcast platform or click the link in the description below gypsy gang